Now a little bit about the man you're going to meet tonight. Yara Lapid has a soft spot for Shakespeare. He listens to the classics, Springsteen and Tchaikovsky. And he is also the head of Yeshatid, the newly formed Israeli political party. That means there is a future. Mr. Lapid began his career back when he was in the army. He wrote for the weekly Bamachane, that's the IDF weekly newspaper. Just two days after he finished his service, he began writing for Ma'ariv. Later on, he started writing for Yediot Achonot, where he had a weekly column that he wrote until October of this year, after he was forced to stop due to his political candidacy. Mr. Lapid was also a prominent news anchor. Most recently, he hosted Ulpan Shishi, which is one of Israel's most popular news uh, programs, and it airs every Friday evening. He is a prolific writer. He's written 11 books, one of which, Memories After My Death, is a tribute to his late father, Tommy Lapid. The elder Lapid was also a journalist turned politician, and uh, he was an ardent secularist who was head of the Shinui political party. He also was an actor. He did a brief stint in Hollywood in the 1980s where he was a screenwriter and a producer, and he wrote and directed two Israeli television series. In 2005, Why Not ranked him 36 on the list of the top 200 greatest Israelis. Oh, and one more thing. In case you guys are worried about his defense policy, Mr. Lapid has a black belt in karate, so don't worry. <laughs> and now, without further ado, I am so proud, on behalf of the entire Tel Aviv International Salon team, to invite Mr. Yair Lapid. Is this, okay, this is the nicest way I was ever unendorsed. <laughs> Thank you, I want to apologize. Um, this, this event was supposed to happen two days ago and it was postponed just because I was as sick as a dog. I, I got a flu, apparently kissing the wrong baby. <laughs> this is the political life. But at least I had a couple of days to learn English. <laughs> While driving here, I was listening over the radio to a foreign minister holding a press conference and talking about the fact that he's not sure he will resign even though he was indicted today uh, in charges of misconduct. And it reminded me, why is it that I'm in politics? I'm in politics because something is fundamentally wrong in the state of Israel. This is not the way things should be held. I mean, he's giving this uh, um, press conference. In the meantime, our former finance minister is in jail. And not the, our former uh, uh, minister of defense last week has switched parties, even though he signed the document saying, he will never do that. And people are running this whole thing like it was a game. And it is not. The reason you are here, the reason you moved from your comfortable lives over here was not to watch a bunch of old-time politicians playing a game on our account. This is not important. The fact that people are promoting themselves, people are saying things and then forget all about it. People are making promises and they're not holding up to, his, to their words. This, 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 is, this is killing us from within. And we have to do something about it. And this is why I'm here on this stage on the cold Tel Aviv evening. Because we have to do something about it. Because the political game became what it is not supposed to be, which is a game. We are now in election time. 
So I don't know if you follow this. Why is it that we are in election time? We are in election time because about, I don't know, five or four, four or five weeks ago, Israel's prime minister stood in a press conference in a, or behind a podium like this one and says, yeah, we have to go to election because I cannot get through with the budget because I'm afraid my political allies, I'm afraid the people who sit in the same coalition with me will blackmail me. And therefore, I have to go into election. And everybody treated it like it was a sensible thing to say. This is not a sensible thing to say. This is the wrong way of doing these things. And the reason he was afraid that he will be blackmailed by his own coalition members is because the coalition he had before, which was the larger coalition, fell, fell apart. Since they couldn't agree on what, which bill should uh, uh, they, they get through to, to replace the Tal bill that was uh, cancelled by the Supreme Court. So they had this huge game. Shaul Mofaz, I don't know how, how aware are you to the names. Shaul Mofaz resigns and they dismantle the whole coalition and everybody was talking for days on and days on who won and who lost who's doing better in the polls, who's doing worse in the polls, who's a better player in this game. And they talked about everything except from what is important. Because the important thing they should have talked about is the fact that this year, 2012, is the year in which Israel crossed the red line. Israel crossed the red line in 2012 because 2012 is the first year in the history of our nation in which more than 50% of the kids who went to school for the first time, 50% of the first graders, went either to a Haredi school or to an Arab school. More than 50% of the six-year-olds are going either to a Haredi school, an ultra-Orthodox school, or to an Arab school, have nothing, God forbid, against Arabs or against Haredi. But this means that if we will not do something about it, 12 years from now, the majority of you will be still young people. 12 years from now, more than 50% of the 18-year-olds will not go to serve in the army, will not go to civil service, and the majority of them will not go into the labor market. And this will be the end of Israel. No country on earth can survive while 50% or more of its population are not participating, neither in defense or in the economy. There's no way to survive this. So we have to do something about it. And we have to do something about it means we start, we have to start at least by talking about it. But our politicians are so busy with playing their games that they're not, they're not even talking about it. This was not mentioned during this campaign. This was not mentioned during, during this uh, uh, election season. Nobody's talking about it. While we're here, this is also happening today, there is a strike of the nurses of Israel. There's a nurses' strike. And everybody say, you know, it's very complicated to close a deal with the nurses because it's election time. Because nobody is talking about the fact that the nurses came to the government of Israel on March. And they said, listen, you have to negotiate with us because our deal expires in January 1st. And the man who was in charge of it in the Ministry of Finance told them, yes, sure, why not, but come back in, in September. And we'll talk to you. So they came back in September. The nurses came back in September. And they found out that the man was, that was in charge resigned and moved to the private sector. So they told them, well, nobody knows the details of the whole thing, so we can't talk to you. So now they're on strike and they're telling them they cannot close a deal with them because it's election time. This is what impo is important. This is what government do. Government is talking to nurses. If government is holding a press conference, we don't want it to be about the fact that the foreign minister was indicted. 
We don't want it to be about the fact that the coalition fell apart. We don't want it to be because politicians are moving from one party to another, stay, saying these, these hollow things, talking the regular rubbish that has nothing to do with the day-to-day -day life of Israelis. Everywhere you go, everything you touch, every stone you pick up, it's the same story. The majority of the people that I see from here, even though I have the light in my eyes, are young. These are, you are young people who came to live in Israel. And it's a beautiful thing. And whoever cares about the Jewish people should have his heart explode from pride when you see so many young people. But I have a, 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 bad, a bad news for you. And it's a bad idea, by the way, in election time to give bad news to the, to the audience. You don't want to upset the audience, but still, if I want to level with you, I have some bad news. You will never have an apartment. <laughs> you will never, ever own an apartment in this country. This is the truth. Sorry. An average apartment, an average flat, a four, four, four room flat in an average a, a neighborhood in Sweden costs 30 salaries. An average apartment on an average neighborhood in England, 71 salaries. An average apartment in an average area in Israel, 128 salaries. Which of you young people is capable of holding his life for 128 months, more than 11 years. I'll save you the mathematics. <laughs> and for more than 11 years, not go out at night, not go on a date, don't switch your car, don't do your master's degree, don't you ever have children, it's too expensive. <laughs> Just put 100% of your salary on a shelf to buy your first apartment. The answer, of course, is no one. So you will never have an apartment. But on the same time, when you look around you, you're going to realize something else. You're going to realize that there are other people, your age or even less, that will have an apartment. Somebody fix them with an apartment. I don't know if you have followed the saga of the housing reform of Israel. You're not supposed to. It's complicated. It's you know, page 13 kind of news. It's very Israeli. So I will update you briefly. After the protests of 2011, when every, all the young people were in the streets, there was this whole carnival of social justice. The government, the Israeli government has announced the Trachtenberg uh, Committee, held by somebody called Mano Trachtenberg. And they sat and they wrote the Trachtenberg Report. Trachtenberg is a word you can use only here or in Holland. <laughs> and they wrote, he wrote, they wrote the Trachtenberg Report. And the Trachtenberg Report said that there is a criteria for to whom the country wants to help in buying their first apartment. And the answer is you. The collective you. The answer is people who served in the army, people who studied a work, and people who have what they call the earning capacity. Earning capacity is the governmental word, wording for working. Okay, the government said if you're working and your spouse work, then we want to help you and to buy your first apartment, not because we are became, became all of a sudden kind, so kind. Countries are not kind as establishments. It's because the country understands you are going to be the future backbone of our society. You are going to be the people who are going to the army. You're going to be the people who work. You're going to be the people who are paying 40 or 48 percent taxes. You're going to be the people who are going to have children that will go to the army. And you're going to do the reserve in between. So it's in this country's best interest to help you buy your first apartment. So the report was given to the government. The government voted it, on it, and unanimously, unanimously, very hard word for foreigners, decided 
to, 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 to accept every detail of it, and it was sent to the Ministry of Housing to be implemented. And it fell on the desk of the Minister of, of, of Housing, Ariel Atias, from the Shas party. And Ariel Atias, of course, has accepted the whole report except for one thing. He took out the earning capacity. He took out work as a quality. And he put, he planted in, in, instead of it, a, thing, a, a criteria that does not exist anywhere in the world. We've checked it. It's called years of marriage. <laughs> I'm serious. Years of marriage. Now you tell me, which fraction of the Israeli public is the one that is getting married the youngest? and therefore have more years of marriage when they're 25 or 26 or 28? The answer, of course, is the public of Ariel Atias, the voters of Ariel Atias, the segment of society of Ariel Atias, the sector of Ariel Atias, the interest group of Ariel Atias, Shas. And this is because he understands his job this way. He understands that he is not the Minister of Housing of you. He is not the Minister of Housing of every young man or woman in this country. He is the Minister of, Gov of Housing of his own interest group. This is the way that things work. It's a game. He's a player. And if this is a game and you're a player, you're supposed to play for your own team. This is the way it works. And there's no Prime Minister to call him and say, listen, you have to be the Minister of Housing for every young man in this country because we are losing a whole generation. Because people look at you and they hear you talking and they hear the accent, they hear the English accent. People your age, when you talk to them, and you know what's the first thing that comes to their mind? There is a free house in Miami. There is a vacancy in LA. Maybe their parents will accept me in New York. We're losing a generation because of these things. But the Prime Minister will never say, will say a word because he's also a player. He also understands the whole concept of it as a game. So we have to do something about it. And the problem is, the reason nothing is being done about it is because when you meet young people like you, they take a peculiar joy of saying, you know what, I'm not interested in politics. Politics is not for me. Politics is weird. Weird people who are saying weird things to each other, who are holding press conferences for things I do not understand, who anyway will close their deals behind closed doors and therefore I have no way of influencing it. This is right, but this is wrong because politics is also the kind of education our children are going to have at school. Politics is also the kind of medical care a grandma is going to get in the hospital. Politics is, is the decision whether there's going to be ever peace in this land or there, it will be an unlasting war. This is also politics. And if you want to change something fundamental in your life, you will have to change it through politics. This is the way, this is the place to change things. This is why I am here standing in front of you. Because what is happening now is that we are allowing ourselves to be corrupted. This country is allowing itself to, to be to, to corrupt for the wrong reasons. The state of Germ the country the state of Germany, okay, Germany is quite a country. 82 million people, fifth economy in the world, holding the entire EU on their shoulders. The state, the, the government of Germany contains 15 ministers. The government of Switzerland, a country approximately the size of Israel, seven and a half million people, contains seven ministers. <coughs> the government of Israel, <laughs> 35 <laughs> ministers and, and deputy ministers who serve as ministers. 35, this is corruption. The definition of corruption is that somebody is cheating 
you and taking something that it is yours. And this is supposed to be ours. We don't need 35 ministers and, and ministries in this country. We are a country the size of Rhode Island. The state of Texas is 40 sometimes bigger than Israel. 35 ministries. The day the election was announced, I was in a convention in Roshai. Okay, and somebody came and, not somebody, Tommy came and she pulled me out and she said, listen, the Prime Minister has just announced that there's going to be a new, a new election and we have outside the Channel 2, Channel 10, Channel 1, everybody's waiting for you to say something. So I went out to say something. And I was waiting, which is what you usually do if you're a politician on television. You wait for your turn to talk. So I was standing there, and you know, you know how they split the screen? So they split the screen, and I'm waiting. Look like a dummy. <laughs> and on the other half of the screen, Charles Mofaz was speaking. I couldn't hear him because I didn't have an earphone, but he was speaking. So it looked, he looked like a little like a fish, you know. <laughs> his, his, his mouth is moving, but I can't hear anything. And I like Charles Mofaz. He's a decent man. He's a decent man. He's a political rival, but he's a decent man. So I'm standing there and I'm looking at this monitor and I, and I have uh, time to, to think my little thoughts. And suddenly it, I remind, it, it, it reminded me that, yeah, Shaul Mofaz, the whole reason this is happening is because Shaul Mofaz resigned a few weeks before from being a minister without a portfolio. What exactly did he resign of? <laughs> If you are a minister without a portfolio, then you are a minister for a driver, you are a minister for a bureau, you are a minister for jobs for your friends, you are a minister for a lot of things. The only thing you do not have is a portfolio. You don't have a work to do. Somebody arranged you with the ministry, but you don't have a real work. And we are looking at it as this is some, I don't know, act of nature. And besides him, only the same government, there are people who doesn't even, do not even admit for having not a real job. Boggy alone is also supposed to be, I don't know him that well, he's supposed to be a decent man, he was chief of staff. I mean, when I, I, I have all the appreciation in the world to whoever dedicates his life to the defense of the state, of the nation. He is the minister of strategic affairs. You've been living in this country for long enough now. Is there anyone in this crowd who has an idea what exactly the Minister of Strategic Affairs is doing? <laughs> Does the State of Israel have strategic affairs that are so confidential that we decided to hide them from the Minister of Defense? So somebody yelled at me one day and said, you don't understand, he's in charge of everything that has to do with intelligence. Wrong. The one who's in charge of anything that has to do with intelligence is the Minister of Intelligence, Dan Merido. <laughs> They're writing something on the door for us not to notice the fact that what is happening is that they just fix themselves with the job. But we do notice. And it influences the entire country. It influences the, the culture that we live in. It creates bureaucracy. It creates, every time you walk through the door of a, of a ministry, of a, of, a, of a government ministry in this country, you always know it will take too long. You always know the bureaucracy will kill you. You always know it will be unple an unpleasant experience. You always know it will take too much time. You know why? Because you don't go into one ministry. You go into five or six or seven. It's a labyrinth of ministries. If you want to build, I don't know, a bus station in Beersheba, do you know how many ministries will be involved? There will be the Ministry of Development of the Negev and the Galilee. There will be the Ministry of Finance because they are financing. There will be the Ministry of Housing because they will build it. There will be the Ministry of Transportation because it's a bus station. There will be the Ministry of Interior Affairs because the land belongs to the country. I'm on the sixth ministry. A bus station. A pole. 
with a piece of metal in the end of it. And it kills us all. And it costs billions and billions of shekels that we need somewhere else. And beside that, it, it, it costs us tens of billions of shekels in the kind of economic culture it creates. Don't ever underestimate economic culture. Economic culture is what kills countries. This is what happened in Greece. They have de developed the wrong economic culture. Because what happened here in Lille, there is a connection, there is a link, an obvious link, between the words minister without a portfolio and somebody who comes to your house or a cab driver you're driving with that finishes his job, turns to you and says, with a receipt or without a receipt. It is connected. It is part of the same culture. It's part of the same way of thinking. Those people are looking at the government. They cannot be blamed. They're looking at the government. They're looking up there and they say, okay, if the government, if our government is not totally committed to be totally honest, why should I? If the ministers think only about themselves, then I want to think about myself too. What's in it for me? That become the slogan of the generation. What's in it for me? You look around you, this is the culture we live in. What's in it for me? You came here from afar. So you're not there yet, but you're supposed to notice by now. Everybody's talking, what's in it for me? What are the tycoons that everybody's talking about? The tycoons are a bunch of businessmen who decided they don't care about anything. They don't care about people who bought their shares. They don't care about the people they employ. They don't care about the big pension funds that bought into their businesses. The only thing they care about is, what's in it for me? What is in it for me? It's all about me. There are companies in the governmental companies, huge governmental companies in this country in which everybody is related to each other and everybody is part of the same political party. Why? It's part of the culture of the what is it for me. So what we need to do is go back. We need to do, what we need to do is rethink the kind of culture we want to live in. What we need to do is being able to talk about values like shared, respons shared responsibility, about values like being a Zionist, meaning an active doing of being part of a general whole. This is what we need to do. We need to say enough. There's one thing I've learned in the less than a year that I'm a politician. They're afraid of us. They are afraid of us. And they do not understand how come we are not saying anything in front of all of this corruption. So we have to say something. And we, when we will say something, it will be changed. This is why I'm here, to change this. This is what we should do to change this. Because in all fields of interest in life, it is always the same story. Even when you go down to the most basic values of the country, equality, this is not a country in which all citizens are equal. Some are equal, and some are a little more equal. I, I, the, one of the things uh, uh, that wasn't mentioned that I used to do before becoming a politician, that I was also a teacher. I taught in a high school in Jaffa for the unprivileged. So, and and this, this year, I taught until this year, this year they have their final exam and in the final exam, about uh, uh, um, uh, in the final exam, they had a whole test about our own Declaration of Independence. And in the Israeli Declaration of Independence, like in the American Declaration of Independence, it says that all citizens are equal, regardless sex, regardless gender, uh, religion, or what was it? Gender, religion, and race. Okay? And my, my students finished the test and they wrote this because I told them everyone is equal. And they put down the pencil and they closed the notebook. And the last bell was heard. And then they went to the army. <coughs> and they were drafted. They didn't think even for a second 
not to go to the army. These are kids, from, as I was saying, from the most unprivileged fractions of society. These are kids that this country has betrayed over and over and over again. They didn't have no hesitation. They all went to the army because they felt this is their duty. And at the same time, other kids, their age, 18, didn't go to the army and they were not drafted because they have political parties that arranged for them not to go to the army and afterwards not to work, not to be employed. And while this is happening, we are not equal. While this is happening, this country cannot claim equality. So we have to change this as well. And you know what? I understand that not every Haredi kid who's 18 is going to become, I don't know, a major general. So they can do civil service. They can go to hospitals. We need people in hospitals. They can help the police. We need people for the police. They can go, you know what? The, in, the, in the country of Israel, there are 200,000 of people who, who survived the Holocaust, Holocaust survivors, that needs help. They were demonstrating a week ago in front of the Prime Minister's office. It was heartbreaking. I was talking to them. I said, what are you demonstrating? Some, one of them told me, you know, my, my glasses are broken and they don't help me fix my glasses. An 80-something-year-old Holocaust survivor. So they should go. Those Haredi kids, they should go to the house of a Holocaust survivor and help him with the dishes and bring him his medicine and sit next to his bed and listen to his story and write this story in a notebook so we can put it in Yad Vashem so it won't be forgotten after he dies. After he dies. And go downstairs with him to sit on the bench to see some people, sometimes weeks and weeks are passing without them seeing a single soul. And this is what they call Bitul Torah. You know what Bitul Torah is? Not studying. They said they can't do that, this because they don't, they, they need this time to study the Torah so they cannot do this civil service. If they need this time to study the Torah, they didn't understand the Torah. The Torah says something completely different. about what is it that we are committed to as people, as human beings, as Jews. This is what we need to do. Because being drafted is just a fraction of life. What you don't understand, no, you do understand. This is three years. But before that, there's a whole schooling system that doesn't teach them about the declaration, Israeli Declaration of Independence or the American or the, or the, the English Magna Carta. Either they don't, to, do not teach the math, or English, or science, or anything else that will make them, make it possible for them to support one day themselves and their children. So they do not evolve later. They do not participate later in the labor market. We cannot afford this. As I was saying to you before, I have no reason to believe I will be able to buy apartments to my children. Why is it that I need to buy apartments to their children? We need to go back to basic saying the idea of equality means everybody has the same duties and the same rights. And let's start with duties. And the reason these things stay the same for all year after year, election after election, is because we let them. The whole ethos of this country, the way this country was built and established is totally different. This country was built and established by people your age, by the way, even less, 21, 22, from all over the world, who came here and said, if I'm not happy with the reality of my life, I'm going to create a different reality. If I'm not happy with the direction my country is taking, I'm going to make sure it will take another direction. Those people said to themselves, this is what I do. I'm a part of a whole. We are all part of something. We are part of something. That's the strength of this place. That's the strength of being Jewish. People spend a lifetime trying to be part of something. 
they always go to the same bar, they join cults, they go to this whole joint street, street gangs, they wear blue bandanas and then they kill somebody else because he wears blue bandanas. Only because they want to be part of something. We have this as a birthright, but we have to work on it every day of our life. And this is what you do and you do it. Also, inside politics. You do it all inside politics because this is where things are happening. This is where you change stuff. If you want to change stuff, what you have to do is ask yourself this question. What is leadership? What is leadership? Leadership, to me, is the ability to make people hope for something and then work together in order to make it happen. This simple. This simple. Leadership is saying to yourself, I'm here. Where do I want to be five years from now? Where do we want to be five years from now? Where do you want this country that you come, came to share a life in to be five years from now? I want to be, to live in a country, five years from now, I want to live in a country which is, came back to be one of the first ten places in the world in education. Is this a dream? We are the startup nation. We are the country that has no, no more Nobel Prize winners than Spain, Finland, and the all Arab countries combined. We are the country that built all this very, very clever machinery that the army uses, all the iron domes of the world. We are the country that has, that is writing more uh, um, science papers and registering more patents than almost any country, other country in the world. Can't we be? One of the ten first places in education in the world, of course we can. We just need to decide that this is what is important. Not the political game, the political result. I want to be five years from now. I want to live in a country in which every kid in Israel who is 25, 6 or 7 has somewhere to live in. That has built 150,000 apartments for, for rent. This has lowers lowered the, par the, the price of apartments to, for, to, uh, uh, for sale for, to 99 salaries instead of 128. This is possible. 93% of the land in Israel is owned by the state. The country has a total control over the stock prices. You just need to understand that this is the most important thing for people if you're like you to have an apartment because when you have an apartment, you have rooted yourself into the ground. I want to live in a country that is that five years from now, this is not a long time, five years from now, has called upon a quarter of a million Israelis who lives now in Miami, in LA, in New York, in Toronto, and tell them to come back. The Israelis who left in the recent years are not the ones who are afraid of the, for, for the, the security reasons. These are the generation that left because Israel middle class, Israel's middle class can't no longer survive the, economic, the economics. And if we we'll tell them that we approved it in 10%, if we we'll tell them that this 10% means that they're going to have a house to live in, and if next to this house they're going to be a good school, and next to this good school they're going to be some sort of a clinic they can trust, and public transportation that comes on time and lives on time, the simple stuff of life. If we'll tell them it is here, and if we'll, we'll remind them that living here, after all, with all the difficulties, have a meaning. Living here is something that has a meaning. Your life are worse while, while living, just by living here. If we'll tell them that, if we'll remind them that, if you will remind them that, they'll come back. And I want in five years for us to be a little nicer to each other. We're not nice to each other. Some talkback-like cultures took over us. People are blunt. Every, uh, I don't know, argument about parking can become a fight. Do you have, and you know what? This is also has to do with politics. Because when people see on television, there's a, there's a link between two Knesset members who are fighting, having a fist fight in our own parliament, and two kids 
who are way uh, over their heads with vodka, who are stabbing a young father in the Be'er Sheva uh, garden just because he said it's 2 o'clock in the morning and my baby is asleep and please, please be a little more quiet. And then they stab him, it's because they are, they have, they are part of the same culture. So we need to change that. We have to bring generosity back to the, the national table. We have to be the kindness. Back to the national table. Because we have to be nicer to each other because of this one simple reason. We are in this together. Thank you very much. I have no idea what is planned for now, so you want to help me? Good. Hi, everyone. Thank you so, so much. Just to touch on one thing that Mr. Lapid spoke about, the Holocaust survivor issue, we actually have a wonderful, wonderful nonprofit organization that I encourage you all to get involved with. It's called Adapt a Safta. And if you, if you would like to adapt your very own Holocaust survivor, with either me or Jay or any member of the salon team. Uh, what we're going to do now is there's going to be a Q&A where you guys can ask Mr. Lapid some tough questions and I encourage you to ask tough questions because that's why he's here and we encourage debate. And uh, I'd actually like to start off with a little question of my own. So one of the things that you that you touched upon, um, and I'll hand you the mic in a sec, one of the things that you touched upon is we're going to sit down. We're going to sit down. Okay. We're going to chill. I'll knock over the water. It'll be awkward. It's okay. Anyways, um, one of the things you touched upon is the importance of sharing the burden. That both Haredi members of society and you and I should all share that burden. I agree with you 100%. Um, it's the logistics I'm a little bit confused about because let's say let's look back a few years uh, with the Emmanuel incident where they tried to forcibly integrate state-funded schools and it caused mayhem. How are you going to prevent that on such a huge scale? I mean, I don't think you can force them into civil service. Well, first and foremost, countries do force their citizens to do things. Nobody ever asked me whether or not I want to pay income tax. And then again, I'm paying. And the first thing we need to do is make sure they understand that if somebody is not joining the army, he will not be supported. Right now, what is happening? Not only they're being drafted to the army, not drafted to the army, they go to the yeshivas, and then we pay their bills. So, excuse me, my language is we screwed ourselves twice. <laughs> so what we need to do is say this is the law of the land. The problem is Israel does not act anymore like a sovereign state. It is so influenced by this tribal uh, interest groups uh, culture we have that things are happening. You look at, uh, I don't know, when Haredi uh, uh, males are sending their wives to the back of the bus in Jerusalem, like they were Rosa Parks in Montgomery, Alabama in the 60s, and, and nobody's saying a word. You need to bring back the ability of the state to say this is me and this is what I'm about and this is the things that are the law of the land and we'll do that and let me tell you, when, you, when it's very obvious that you're not, not going to back off, people tend to understand that it's a, not a good idea to, to disobey. And I even can tell you how I know that. Because if you look at the, at the, at the employment market, in which they said they also keep saying, you know, that the Haredi man will never work because this is part of his religion. But I've been to Brooklyn, and in Brooklyn, all Haredi men work. Okay, so they cannot sell us this as uh, uh, something that cannot be forced. It can be forced, and it will be forced. You want me to? I did. Yeah, I'll do that. I didn't host for a while now. Yeah, sure. Just yell. Ah, uh, we have okay. We have microphones. Yeah, it will be so. Just yeah. Hi. So when I tell friends that I'm thinking of voting for Yael Lapid, 
you know, all the arguments make sense, but then they often say, well, centrist parties in Israel, they tend to fall apart after one election. Yaila Pid, hopefully he'll get a lot of votes, but the odds are that he's not going to get that many votes. So what influence can he really have? And how long is he in the game for? So I'm just interested in your thoughts on that. Well, uh, first and foremost, I, oft, I have also noticed the fact that central parties in Israel tend to collapse because one of them collapsed in my own living room. <laughs> and, 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 yeah, well, the ones who are laughing are the ones who are here long enough to know the story of my father's party. It was nice of you not to mention him by name.